Hello, 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 everybody. Here is Talk Talk with Wild again, talking about different topics of society. Remember, guys, that we create and design this podcast to let everybody know about Harvard University and the magazine of Harvard Medical School. You can also visit our official website, which is magazine.hml.harvard.edu. You will be able to browse thousands of thousands of articles by issue or by topic. You will be asking Dr. Wild, which topics do we have? Research, community, education, care delivery, awards, and achievement. All right, guys, the article to review today is Energy Grip. Collaborations between scientists and non-scientists are shifting disease research toward what may become its new paradigm. An excerpt from We the Scientists How a Daring Team of Parents and Doctors Forget a New Path for Medicine. Until the late 19th century, there were no professional scientists. Science was pursued by anyone with curiosity, intense passion, and personal interest in a topic. In the 20th century, however, the notion that anyone could be a scientist gave way an establishment of the profession science began again. To get in, you need years of study, the acquisition of expertise, specialist training under the tutelage of seasoned veterans, and a university degree. From Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard University, I want to remind to everybody who are listening to me by these audios, you can download this beautiful article from the magazine at Harvard Medical School. Alright, I continue doing this review straight away. Over time, scientists' projects got more complicated and more expensive to run. Governments stepped in providing grants to fund research. As a steward of public monies, they required that recipients demonstrate some sort of sanctioning expertise. Professional direct studies evaluate the utility of the projects, gather the data and analyze and publish their results. Scientists still need help from wider society for one thing they want patients and families to lobby congress for more government funding to support basic science and advocate for bigger push for agencies that gave research grants such as the national institute of health they need patients to enroll in the clinical trials they organize and to donate blood tissues and other samples to help advance their research which revolves around questions they found the most interesting. When I first began reporting on the NPC Ninen Peak Disease Type C project, I could see the parents and scientists were trying to construct a fundamentally new kind of collaboration. They were good who all want to save the children's life. But despite the common goal, it quickly became apparent that they had different attitudes and approach toward the production of science. For over half a century, the focus in medical research had been on discovery launched by an individual investigators and experiments inside a lab. The parents tried to force the lab doors open, they didn't intend to follow the usual rules. This new group of citizen scientists start collecting data about themselves. They released patients driving studies online and found themselves city of experts by a director of the NIH who in a blog post about the work linked to their self-report data alongside a paper published in a traditional scientist journal. The pandemic offers a story opportunity to finalize, build an infrastructure that can both enable and grow citizen science. Chris 
Austin was the neurology resident on call one evening in 1989 when a severely ill patient arrived by ambulance to his hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. The patient had late stage amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, a fatal neurological disorder also known as low-grade disease that paralyzed people's muscles. The man had signed to not resuscitate order and want to die at home, but because a miss up, the paramedics revived him. Angry what his wishes had been dissolved, the man requested that the ventilator keeping him alive be shut off. Doctor at the hospital complied with the patient's plea. The 29 years old Chris had sat with the family at the bedside, watching as a life ever away, into three hours before the man took his final breath. Through the long and agonizing vigil, Chris felt increasingly enraged not only at his own healthiness but as at the system that seemed him to be failing its most central task, healing the sick. Chris had undergone years of grilling and intense training at some of the top institutions in the United States. He graduated summa cum laude in biology at Princeton University, earned his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, and was accepted for a top neurology resident at Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the more premier hospitals in the United States. He has the product of the best that medicine had to offer and yet in his retelling of the story he couldn't offer much. He always emphasized that his job that evening was to turn off the monitors when the patient died. His moral distress that he could not do more shoot him to the core. The disease Chris encouraged most frequently in the neurology clinic were incredible and devastating. Huntington's disease recently destroyed nerve cells in the brain. Alzheimer's disease stripped people of their memories and identity. Chris patients came into the office seeking hope and more often than not, he had no effective therapy to offer. He usually wasn't even able to point to a promising drug on the horizon. I couldn't stand simply telling patients with incredible neurological disease that there was nothing we could do for them and having that made life work. Chris recounted, as a doctor, Chris saw one patient at the time and tried to allay their symptoms. He evaluated the relationship he developed with his patients and their families. Working in a neurology clinic taking care of people over the course of many years gave him insight into the magnitude and burden of the disease he treated. Dr. Chris set out to understand the ecosystem of medicine. He joined the laboratory of Constance Seppo, a developmental biologist and genetics at the Harvard Medical School. He figured out that by studying genetics, his finding might lead to advance in the file, potentially reaching more people than he could care for in a clinic. In the laboratory, he learned the foundations of basic genetics, devising experiments with modern organisms such of mice and fruit flies that sometimes share important common genes with humans. While Dr. Chris spent most of his time running experiments in the laboratory, he continued to see neurology patients moonlining at Massachusetts General Hospital as well as the community hospital that had a walk in a clinic where patients with no insurance could come in off the street.
science and the scientists who love and practice it were isolated from the people that want to help and need it to engage in order to advance, researching ultimately about the patients, about humanity, Dr. Chris said, but one a day-to-day -day basis is divorced from that. Everywhere he looked at, he saw a divide. Researchers didn't focus on the body as a whole, but rather specialists in made different parts. Cancer doctors treat the breast, prostate, or the brain as if they were separate entities, even though the gene mutations that cause cancer in one organ might be the same in another, or located along common molecular pathways. Drugs that were already been prescribed for one disease might be usual in treating another, but there was no systematic program that tried to identify these compounds. By November 2002, he was in concert at the NAH as senior advisor for transactional researchers to Francis. Chris came to the NIH at the time when the agency's mission was the subject of public debate. The NIH funding came from the people and therefore some scientists are where the money should be spent on basic research, studies that focus on fundamental scientist questions or strive to understand the process that drug disease. Funding the research to turn ideas into drugs that could be used at a patient's beside should be left up at the pharmaceutical companies this line of argument went. Dr. Chris knew from his own experience that patients, especially those with a rare disease, could not be relied on drug companies to find solutions for them. One only had to look to the statistics that were around 7,000 no disease that affect humans and only 500 had treatments. Many people were left without recourse on options. Chris set out to build a laboratory containing sophisticated equipment that could do rapid screening of drug libraries, enable or more accelerated approach to identify potential compounds to treat disease. Dr. Chris built a robotic system at the NAH laboratory that could do the type to automate screening typically employed at drug companies. It costs around 30 United States dollars millions, was fully automated and include three robots that walk around the clubs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Dr. Chris estimated that robots screen hundreds of thousands of compounds every day to help spread the word about the laboratory Dr. Chris spent a lot of time on the road traveling. Dr. Chris figured out that the people most likely to want to partner with NAH would be scientists working at universities or medical centers who didn't have access to the kind of sophisticated screening technologies the new NIH laboratory boasted. Dr. Chris also filed requests for help from people who were not scientists. Many of them barely recalled the fundamentals of their high school biology class but had turned themselves into experts on conditions most general practitioners never saw. A rare disease conference after Dr. Chris gave a talk, ordinary people with no scientist training, it all frequently waited for the crowds to disperse so they could tell their stories to him. Some were parents of children with fatal diseases who had raised funds and were looking to support good ideas that might help their children and accelerate the development of a drug. 
Dr. Chris Quine to build a scientist team consisting on patients and advocates and parents as well as scientists, clinicians and researchers. Good professional scientists and citizen scientists work together at partners and combine their different types of expertise? That's a question. Scientists could never know the answer for sure unless they run the experiments. Now all Dr. Chris needed was an opportunity to test the idea. He finally got a chance in November 2007. More than a dozen people show up for the meeting in Dr. Chris's laboratory to discuss the prospect of working together. All right, guys, remember you can download this beautiful Dr. Go Wild podcast from Harvard Medical School, from Spotify, and Google Podcasts. See you next time. Bye bye.